In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. I also serve St. Luke's Covington and Trinity St. John Lutheran School in Nashville. Thank you so much for tuning into our Bible class. Today we conclude our study of the book of Acts. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Last week we studied Acts 27, one of the famous we sections of the book of Acts. There Luke told us of the first legs of Paul's trip to Rome. He is guarded by a centurion named Julius who comes to trust him and think pretty highly of him. They sail from Caesarea to a port along the coast of modern-day Turkey where they book passage on a ship carrying grain from Egypt to Rome. The winds are uncooperative, however, and the season for safe sailing passes quickly. Against Paul's warnings, they continue on the voyage and fall victim to a tremendous storm off the coast of Crete. For days on end, they are driven west by the wind. One night during the 14-day storm, an angel of the Lord stood by Paul and assured him, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Eventually the ship ran aground off the coast of an island. Miraculously, all 276 people on board, sailors, soldiers, passengers, and prisoners, make it safely to shore, just as the Lord promised, even as the surf pounds the ship to pieces. Now we're ready for chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. It turns out they're on the island of Malta, well known in modern times. And here you see what kind of person Paul really is. He's always ready to pitch in and do his part. He's not off by himself somewhere licking his wounds or arrogantly assuming that others ought to get him what he needs. No, he goes right to work gathering sticks for a fire. He sees his fellow passengers wet and cold and wants to help. Apparently the storm is still raging, at least it's still raining. Unknown to him, there's a viper hiding in the sticks. The heat of the fire drives it out and it fastens its fangs onto his hand. Now Jesus had made promises to his disciples about just such an occasion. He told them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Mark 16. These miracles were to accompany those who went out preaching the gospel as confirmation from the Lord himself that their preaching and teaching were true. 
When 72 of Jesus' representatives came back from a missionary journey, he told them, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Luke 10. Jesus keeps his promise. Paul just shakes off the viper and it falls into the fire, and its poison has no effect on Paul. The locals are astonished. When the snake first bit him, they assumed he must be guilty of something serious, such as murder. It's natural for people to have some idea of justice that those who do serious wrong ought to suffer serious consequences. This is part of the natural knowledge of God, and its presence in the heart of people who have never studied the scriptures is yet one more evidence that there is a God, a God who made human beings, gave them a conscience, and will one day call all humans to account. The people on Malta had this sense, but once they saw he was going to be okay, they completely changed their mind. They assumed he must be a God. This reminds us of that time on the first missionary journey when Paul and Barnabas were at Lystra. And after a healing, the people were going to offer sacrifices to them. But Paul and Barnabas cried out, Man, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their ways, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Acts 14. In other words, no doubt Paul and Luke and Aristarchus used this as an opportunity to speak of Jesus and the message of the gospel that Jesus had sent them to share. After the chief man of the island, a guy named Publius, received them with hospitality, it became known that his father was sick with dysentery, potentially deadly. Paul went into him, prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. This is the first miracle we read of Paul since he was arrested in Jerusalem more than two years before. Remember, these miracles were not done willy-nilly, but rather to confirm the gospel preaching and teaching of the apostles. No doubt when Paul prayed over this man, he was asking the Lord whether he ought to heal him. The Lord gave his assent and the, the power was there and many more healings followed. The rest of the people who were sick on the island came and were healed. Now Acts 28, 11 and following. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Well, about three years before this, Paul had written to the Christians in Rome, I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Romans 1. Once again, Paul receives the blessings of being part of the family of believers. The saints in Rome hear that Paul is coming. They send delegations to meet him. One of them meets up with him about 30 miles from Rome, the other about 40 miles away. There have been Christians in Rome since Pentecost, Acts 2, but this is the first time one of the apostles has come to Rome. What a joyful meeting that must have been. No wonder Paul thanked God and took courage. In now verses 17 and following. After three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. 
For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Paul still loves his fellow Jews, and he has not given up on them. Far from pressing charges against the Jews for their treatment of him, once settled in Rome and under house arrest, he initiates meetings with the leaders of the various Jewish synagogues in Rome. He's following through with what he wrote in that same letter to the Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1. Our friends who work in Jewish evangelism urge us today not to forget Jewish people, but to make them a priority. And the Lord has blessed that. In the last few decades, there has been a swell in the number of Jews becoming Christians. Some of them, like Paul, keep the Jewish festivals and customs as a teaching tool and a way to reach other Jews with the gospel. In spite of all the abuse he had endured at the hands of fellow Jews, he still loves them all and yearns for their salvation. See Romans chapters 9 to 11 for his thorough discussion of God's plan to save both Jews and Gentiles. His belief is what Israel has hoped for for centuries the resurrection of the body and the life in the world to come through the Messiah. We continue with verse 23 and following. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. The response in Rome, then, was similar to what Paul encountered in many other towns where he visited. Some believe in the Lord Jesus, and some reject him. Paul applies the words Isaiah used to describe the stubborn people in his own generation. What we have here is a strong warning written in Isaiah 6 when the prophet was first called to be a spokesman to God's stubborn people in Jerusalem and Judea. God is patient and long-suffering, abounding in mercy. But there does come an end to his patience. In most cases, that end does not come until we die. But sometimes God, in his justice, can confirm people in their stubborn rejection during their lifetimes. The example of Pharaoh in Egypt comes to mind. Again and again, Pharaoh hardened his heart as the Lord performed miraculous signs, one right after the other, as the ten plagues unfolded right in front of his eyes. The Lord's spokesman, Moses, spoke God's word into his very ears. But Pharaoh, of his own stubbornness, rejected the Lord. And finally, we read of the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart, confirming him in his rejection of the Lord. What could be a more fair punishment than to give someone what they want? Jesus used this same section in Isaiah 6 to explain one reason why he spoke in parables, Matthew 13. In John 12, the evangelist tells us that this is why some of the very people who witnessed many miraculous signs of Jesus did not believe in him. And now let's finish the chapter, verses 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. We would certainly like to have had an account from Luke as to how the case was resolved. 
But Luke is not writing a biography of Paul. Remember, the star of the book of Acts is not Paul or Peter or any of the apostles. The star is the word of God. The acts recorded in the book are really the deeds of the Lord Jesus himself, acting through the word of the gospel by the power of the spirit proclaimed by members of his body on earth. We so easily get caught up in the cult of personality. It still happens in the church today when our attention ought to be focused on what God is doing through his means of grace as proclaimed by fellow sinners today. With that thought in mind, the ending of the book of Acts makes perfect sense. The word of the gospel wins out. It progresses to Rome, the most important city in the world. There Paul, for two whole years, proclaims the kingdom of God and teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. He preaches and teaches as a lowly prisoner, but the word of God he proclaimed was not bound. Here are some songs from some others who may seem lowly to us, but they're precious in God's eyes. I'm talking about the kindergartners and pre-K four-year-olds from Trinity St. John Lutheran School. The other day, Mrs. Janice Lange, their music teacher, brought them outside where they could take off their masks and sing while socially distancing. The word of God they sing is indeed powerful. I don't know about you, but going through the book of Acts this way has been a blessing to me. It got me deeper into the book than ever before, and that was wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to conclude our studies with remarks written by Dr. Paul Meyer, a pastor and historian, in the Bible study he co-authored for the Life Light series from Concordia Publishing House. He says, Luke, who was clearly present on this occasion, closes the scene and also the book of Acts with the following intriguing verse. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened then, Luke? Why did Paul have to wait two years for his hearing or trial before Nero? What was Paul's fate, Peter's, yours for that matter? What about the great fire of Rome? that destroyed much of the city just three years after you break off your account? And why did Nero persecute the Christians so horribly after that fire? No serious student of the New Testament has failed to fire these questions at the beloved physician and friend of Paul. Many biblical scholars dream of someday finding an ancient scroll that would take up the history where Acts leaves off. But the conclusion of Acts is, in fact, honest and satisfactory after all, because Luke's great purpose was only to show how the gospel had spread from Jerusalem to Rome, Acts chapter 1. He certainly did just that, and with distinction. Of all the religious beliefs in the world, past or present, none have more thoroughly based themselves on history than Judaism and Christianity. For that reason, it is possible to use the tools and sources of ancient history to give answers to some of the nagging questions just posed. Let us try to answer as many as we can. 
Why did Paul have to wait two years for his trial before Nero? Simply because Nero was not in Rome at the time to hear his case. And the reason for that is quite extraordinary. Very near the time that Paul's ship was gliding into the Bay of Naples in March of 59, Nero had just arranged to have his mother murdered. Nero then grew so worried at how the people of Rome would react to the murder of his own mother that he did not return to his capital for many months, hence the delay in Paul's hearing. How was Paul's case before Nero decided? The hearing also had to wait until Paul's accusers arrived from Judea, if they went to the effort of making the trip. His chief prosecutor, the high priest Ananias, had been deposed, and Ananias' successor may not have been interested in the case. Paul's opponents in Palestine, then, could achieve much more by doing nothing at all, but this would leave their target in a peculiar legal limbo. Still, there's little doubt that Paul finally did face Nero himself for trial because God had told Paul that he would stand before Caesar, Acts 27. What probably happened is that one of Paul's more powerful Roman friends pressed the case for him, and Paul eventually had this day in court. Some Jewish or Roman substitute prosecutor would have raised the three original charges first lodged against Paul at Caesarea by Tertullus, chapter 24. For his part, Paul would have offered a by now predictable defense, including the episode on the Damascus Road, which might have made the superstitious Nero a bit uncomfortable. And although Nero had murdered his mother and his list of crimes was growing, he had not yet reached the state of immorality and cruelty associated with his later reign. Accordingly, with Paul's eloquence and Agrippa II's statement on his behalf on the one hand, and the less than impressive charges on the other hand, Nero may indeed have acquitted the apostle. At this point, the Roman state had not yet declared Christianity illegal. Although some important scholars disagree, there is strong, though not absolutely conclusive, evidence that Paul actually was acquitted after his first trial at Rome and that he subsequently visited both Spain in the West, as he writes of in Romans 15, where he describes his desire to go from Rome to Spain, and his beloved mission churches in the East. The pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, cannot be fitted satisfactorily into the three mission journeys and they tell of Paul's later activities in the Aegean world. Clement of Rome and other early church fathers also confirm his mission to Spain. If he did visit Spain, Paul would next have returned eastward to confirm the faithful in a fourth missionary journey to the Aegean. Titus refers to Paul's work on the island of Crete, and the other pastoral epistles have him back in Greece and then Asia Minor. There, probably because of a dispute with a certain Alexander the coppersmith, mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, he was arrested a second time and sent to face Nero once again. Now, about A.D. 66 or 67, Paul would have been in mortal danger at Rome, whatever the charges that had brought him there. Two years earlier, Nero, in deflecting from himself the public outcry that he had set fire to Rome, blamed the Christians for arson and tortured them to death. Being a Christian now carried the death penalty, so Nero or his justices could hardly acquit this strange and troublesome leader of the Christians. This time Paul had no illusions about being set free. When his last day had come, the apostle was presumably accompanied in his final journey across Rome to the Ostian Gate by a grieving group of friends who had survived the cruel first wave of persecution. Several miles beyond the gate, on the road to the port of Ostia, stood the chopping block. While the sword was being prepared by the executioner, Roman citizens were not crucified, Paul doubtless made a last statement. His words were very probably similar to what he had written earlier to his young co-worker Timothy. The time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy 4. The blade dropped, 
the apostle died, the greatest missionary, the greatest theologian in the history of Christianity, and above all, the one who had universalized its message. Sustained by the hope of the resurrection that was the centerpiece of all his preaching, Paul's friends must then have buried him nearby along the Ostian Way. The much-traveled apostle would have appreciated that gesture, buried alongside a highway. Today the road connects Rome with her international airport at Ostia. And whatever happened to Luke and the apostles, after remaining at Paul's side and tending to any of his medical needs, Luke finished the gospel named for him, as well as the book of Acts. Then he labored in Bithynia, where he died at age 74, full of the Holy Spirit, according to one early church tradition. Peter was most likely martyred in some connection with Nero's persecution at Rome. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, carried his ministry to Ephesus, according to early Christian tradition, where he also acted as dutiful foster son to Mary, the mother of Jesus, a role assigned to him at Calvary. Peter's brother Andrew went to the north shore of the Black Sea, Scythia then, Ukraine today. Thaddeus preached in Syria and Armenia, Bartholomew and Thomas in Persia and India. Barnabas missionized the islands while his cousin Mark, happily reconciled with Paul, wrote his gospel in Rome. Others worked elsewhere. This list is not complete. Even though the second half of Luke's fascinating record in Acts has focused almost entirely on Paul of Tarsus, the other apostles then were also doing their part to fulfill the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Like Paul, all endured daunting hardships for the faith, many suffering martyrdom. Not one of them could see the ultimate triumph of Christianity except through the eyes of faith and the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit who had arrived on that extraordinary Pentecost and had never withdrawn. Though at the time the Christian cause seemed persecuted, burned, crucified, beheaded, and even eaten out of existence by the greatest power in the world, a greater power was at work that would see Christianity conquer Rome a little more than two centuries later, and the ends of the earth after that in Jesus' own prediction. It was Christ, not Caesar, who captured the future. Every one of the more than one billion Christians in the world today should be grateful to Luke and his gifted pen for telling us how the most successful enterprise in all of history began its spiritual conquest of the Mediterranean and the globe. His record remains an inspiration for the church today, which is only an extension of the book of Acts across 20 centuries, completing Luke's account in a sense Believers should have no trouble identifying with the ordeals facing the apostles. We have our own ordeals today, or with their triumphs, we also have our successes. The same God animates both the past and the present. If we can enter our own names into a spiritual book titled Acts of the Holy Spirit this year, then our series on the Acts of the Apostles will have achieved its aim. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange on the guitar. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 
You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we begin Luke's other book, The Gospel According to St. Luke. Thanks for listening. Thanks to our partners at V1047. Thanks to our sponsors at St. John's. These studies are also available at stjohnsnewminden.org. Click on Radio Archives in the date of the broadcast. You can also find audio recordings of worship services posted there. Please stay tuned for worship from our sister congregation, Trinity Lutheran Church, Nashville. <laughs>